Spirituality Matters. So now I invite you to settle in and let's find that sacred space between here where I am and there where you are and let us be reminded that the Holy transcends our physical bodies. And our time together is just as meaningful and sacred as if we were sitting beside one another. Okay, so let's get started. This week's teaching theme is the dark side of kindness. And I really did enjoy exploring the, just the concept of kindness because the reason why I wanted to do this is because part of it is what happens when I push back on particularly hateful or toxic comments that might come up on some of my social media content. And when I respond that way, some people will respond back by saying, wow, you just tore that comment apart without being mean. Or they'll say, I wish I had the gift of being able to be kind, but not taking any bull. All right, so is that a goal for all of us to be kind, to be someone who can be kind, but not take bull? Well, I don't know, but it did make me think of a sign that I keep on, on my office wall, which says, have courage and be kind. And that was the first thing I thought of when I thought about doing a teaching theme on just the dark side of kindness. And we'll explain that a little bit in the podcast, but be sure to also check out my blog and some of what I'll be teaching throughout my social media platforms uh, on Instagram and TikTok in particular. But notice that the phrase isn't have courage, but be kind. It is have courage and be kind. So it doesn't attribute that phrase to anyone. It's just a general phrase, but it is something that we all could consider to leave, to live by. But because courage is synonymous with kindness. So what do we need to do to attain that? Well, it got me thinking about the actual definition of what is it, what does courage actually mean? So off to the dictionary I went and I found the quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, pain, without fear. It also is synonymous with bravery. Well, the only thing I would change about that definition, because when I think about being courageous, for me especially, as someone who knows that some of my, my content can be considered controversial, not because I'm trying to to get anybody to offend anybody, but because I'm reaching the people who have been hurt by or, by organized religion, by in particular Christianity, they're wanting to heal from religious trauma. So my content can seem somewhat controversial if you feel like I'm attacking you, which I'm not. But sometimes I'll be a little hesitant. I'll be steeped in fear that comes from my indoctrination in that belief. So I'll be like, oh, should I should I post this? But I really want to to get this point out so I can reach my followers and talk to them about this. So I might have a little fear, but I don't let it control me. So I allow courage to come forth so I can use my voice in the way I know I'm being called to use my voice. So then it made me think of the word encourage. So when we encourage people, what we're doing is actually empowering them with courage, empowering them to know to step forth to use their voice with courage, with confidence, with their spirit at the core of their message. So that means with authenticity. So that word is very sacred because we're asking people to come from an element of their truth. So anyway, that's a little bit of a sidebar, except I want you to park that, that saying, have courage and be kind. So these are very important words for to, to just anchor our time here together talking about the dark side of kindness. And you're thinking, why in the world is she talking about the dark side of kindness? Well, it's coming. So if you are open to receiving this wisdom as I am, then we can see that there is an element of teaching in any interaction that we have with other people, including words that are meant to hurt us that are meant to harm us. So if we can, in a way, or I should, also should say, if they're meant to silence us, which I think a lot of when people are commenting to me, that's exactly what they're trying to do. So are we willing to look at those comments, at, the, at those negative comments, at the criticism, at the pushbacks that we might receive and see them for what they are, teaching moments? So that's what we're going to look at today.
But sometimes I think that people, when they look, they look at my responses and they cannot see themselves in it. They see, oh, wow, you just did something I'm not able to do. So they're able to, they, they, differentiate, they differentiate themselves from something I'm doing versus something that they, they know that's not in them yet. So I'm praying and hoping that they're going there, that they see that this, that what I'm doing is only possible because I am on a path of healing. I'm on a path of self discovery. Part of my spiritual growth is entrenched in how I show up in the world. So there's a level of accountability in what, in my healing that allows me to see what is mine to receive as true criticism of my character versus what is something, somebody trying to put on me to deflect me or control me. And that requires discernment and wisdom. But also what happens, especially for those of you who are like me, who have, who grew up in organized uh, Christianity or went to church or so had some kind of indoctrination into uh, a, a Christian belief, you might be confused exactly what kindness is. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But that misunderstood notion about kindness often prevents us from having honest and healthy dialogue because we're afraid that we're going to be viewed as not being kind. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So it, it also, this fear of being perceived of not as not being kind, it can also stop us from having healthy boundaries around our lives or how we use our voice as an ally, as an advocate, which I believe as, as all of you know, I am an ally that especially with the, I support the LGBTQIA community and I believe Black Lives Matter. So I, in order for me to be able to use my voice in a constructive way, I have to come from a place of healthy dialogue, which is being having courage and being kind, or my dialogue is not going to be productive. It's not going to be helpful to those with whom I'm trying to help. So that is the premise behind everything we're going to be talking about today. So let's get into it. I've never been able to use that phrase before, but I think I used it right. I've heard other people say it, but we're just going to get into it and we're going to go from there. So we're going to start by talking about what does kindness mean? So we talked a little bit about courage, but now let's talk about the word kindness and what it means. So off to the dictionary we go, and here are some of the, the top uh, definitions for it. The state or quality of being kind, for instance, kind or compassionate to animals, a kind act or favor. So something that is considered a loving gesture, uh, a compassionate gesture towards another person or some kind of behavior, or even a friendly feeling. And they use the phrase, I will never forget their kindness. So in other words, kindness becomes a way to describe you because of the way that you, the feelings that of your presence or your actions evoke in someone else. So that's a beautiful way to look at it as well. And some of the synonyms were benevolence, humanity, generosity, charity, sympathy, compassion, and tenderness. So I, during this research, there was all kinds of research about what it means to be kind and why we fear authenticity if it means that we are not we are not going to be viewed as being kind and i love what i read in this one article which says that as children we do not we not we do not view the world as a separate entity there is no me in other words there is no me in the world the world is just we're just exploring we don't necessarily understand boundaries or anything it's all about joy and curiosity and just feeling and smelling and touching and listening everything is about in the, the wonder of the world but as we develop we start to become more possessive 
And some of the things to protect the things that we consider that, that did bring us joy, that we feel that, that are threatened, but we don't quite understand those emotions, anger starts to rise, protectiveness starts to rise, jealousy starts to rise, defensiveness starts to rise. So things that, what, that we do to protect our little world because we don't understand our place in the bigger world. So what this psychologist was surmising is that if we get stagnant in that part of our human development, that we don't understand that we are part of the bigger element of, of the world. And there are things that, uh, there are things out here in this bigger realm of humanity that we can share, that we, we, we learn, uh, we lose a critical element of what it means to be kind. Because kindness is rooted in compassion. It's rooted in fairness. It's rooted in seeing yourself as not separate from humanity, but belonging in it. So if, if somewhere between our development as children and into adulthood, we're not getting those lessons related to kindness and fairness and sharing, then that spills into our adult life and our ability to understand that kindness does come from an awareness that we're okay if we don't necessarily control everything in our environment. So I thought that was interesting because I could see that that, that element of kindness is necessary as we grow and mature and how it impacts us throughout, throughout our lives. But I also read another cycle, and all these, all these reports will be in your show notes. It's a whole page of things that you might find interesting if you wanna learn a little bit more about kindness, especially if you're one of those who resonates with someone who says, who says to me, I don't know how you do it. How are you kind and not take bull? How are you able to do that? And you wanna understand more about it. These articles might really help you a little bit more. So be sure to check out the show notes. So another psychologist said that there is people confuse kindness with agreeableness. And agreeableness is somewhat is a, is a character trait um, where you are afraid to you want to try to avoid conflict. You hate conflict. So you become not only the peacemaker, but the acquiescer. So you are always acquiescing to keep the tension down. And you somehow have been, been, you're equating that to being kind, but you're suppressing yourself, making yourself smaller in whatever situation it is, whether it's a family situation, an intimate situation, or with colleagues or whatever, you're, you're, you're minimizing yourself to make sure that you can be a part of just keeping everything smooth. You might not agree with what's happening. You might have very strong feelings about it, but you suppress that because your need to be seen as agreeable, which you've confused with kindness, is all mixed in there. And it's interesting, the psychologist says that women consistently score higher on the agreeableness scale than men. In other words, women have a tendency to be more concerned about how they're viewed, about being agreeable than men. I think that still speaks a little bit to a very strong patriarchal uh, society where st we still are that, even though you still have a strong, strong women, women are uh, brought up, especially if you are a, a strong patriarchal system inside of evangelical Christianity or where the father uh, or the, the male uh, authority in your life, whatever they said go went, you had no room for debate. Those kinds of things will obviously impact how you show up in, in the world. But what that ends up happening at the end of the day is that your this fear of loss and conflict means that you fail to set boundaries. You are easy to take advantage of and no one really knows how you feel. They assume things. They just assume that you're easy to get along with. And maybe they've even used the word kind to, to describe you, which also continues to affirm what you think you're supposed to be, which is actually acquiescing your power, giving over your power to somebody else. And so there's a little bit of a fear of being rejected if you ever used your voice. 
So just something to think about here, but some of that fear comes from the, uh, where fear of being excluded, where fear of being pushed out. There's, they, they call that like a, this tribal thought, which would make you feel that, well, my family will disown me if I don't, if I share how I really feel, or my, my church, my spiritual community will excommunicate me. If I tell them how I really feel, my colleagues won't agree with me. If I tell them that I don't appreciate the way that they talk about people in meetings or whatever it is, you're afraid that you're going to be rejected in some way. So you can to that, that, so it's like a self-perpetuating cycle that is very hard to break. So if any of that resonates with you, I encourage you to read those articles and then start in a very intentional practice to figure out how you can start to break some of those cycles. Another thing that I read, like I said, there was so much information here. I was really kind of surprised. I thought I was just going to be going down one, one element of kindness, talking about like this dark side of kindness where people are afraid to use their voices, but there's so much more here. And I really did enjoy researching this week. But another psychologist wrote about the difference between active generosity and harmless people. So you might, you might have kindness, your label might be kindness, but does that really mean that you are in a, a place of active generosity versus being considered harmless and boundaryless. So what that looks like is active generosity might be something like, you know, someone is, is hurting, whether it's a hurt relationship, you know, financially, whatever it is, they're going through a hard time. You have the strength and the nurturing, uh, intuitive wisdom to reach out to them from a place of care. And you're going to give them what they need. In other words, not to the point of that it hurts you, but you can give them what you have to give them and to help them, whether it's a thought, a call, a text, flowers, whatever it is, whatever that you know that will speak to their heart and you're able to do that. That's active generosity. You're not going past some a level of comfort for yourself. You're not bending yourself so much to the point where their problem becomes your problem, because then we're starting to talk about enabling and we don't have time to go to take that left turn today. But harmless people will use passive generosity. And they, again, this goes back to this whole blurred uh, definition of what you think kindness might be, but passive generosity looks like this. Here are a couple of examples. Let's say you're in line at the grocery store. And I've seen this happen, especially now that we're supposed we're in, in the middle of the pandemic while we're recording and you're supposed to stand six feet apart. Well, sometimes people will come in and cut in because they don't see you back there and they're just in their own way. A passive person who is in this or a harmless person who's in this harmless frame of mind won't say a word because they think that it's rude to say something, that they won't be kind if they say something. Well, this is gonna to continue to happen. People are gonna keep cutting you off if you don't say. So that's almost like a metaphor for life. That line that's in the grocery store is like your life played out in front of you. Because it's okay for you to say, I'm sorry, I'm standing here, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just respecting our space here, the lines back here. Now how they respond to it isn't your responsibility. But you holding your space, and those are kind words. They just feel differently coming out. So are you, an, are you a kind person utilizing active generosity or are you a harmless person utilizing passive generosity that really isn't helping anybody? Because like I said, that's like a metaphor for your life and how other people treat you. A couple other examples that might resonate with you. You tell a, a, a family member, you find out that they took money from you, whether it's an account, your, your wallet was sitting there like, Hey, I, I just took your last $20. I hope you don't mind. And you say nothing. Or, um, somebody decides to take up, they, they, you are all planning this party together, uh, this, whatever it is together. And your friends change their mind at the last minute. They forget to tell you, you show up someplace else. They forget to tell you, and they're at the other place partying and you don't, you don't say anything because you're afraid that your friends will be offended if you do. Is this, am I, uh, am I speaking to anybody out there today about this? 
because I feel like I am. And I also, I recognize elements of myself in this as well that certainly have, I've been able to shred off through some very intense work, but I also try to stay in a place where I always am looking at, at things and saying, does this serve my highest good? Am I going to show up in the world serving those who I'm called to serve if these elements are in my life? And the answer is always no. So I always have, that's, that's part of this spiritual growth, this spiritual work that I talk about. Soul work is not spiritual light. People who talk about the spiritual but not religious path being the, the light choice, they're absolutely wrong. There's a sense of accountability about your life and what you're, you're, you are to heal. So that while we're here, while we're these immense loving souls having this human experience, we're showing up as in our highest form of self so that the physical self is aligned with the God self. And so that we can continue to do that work. So are we also apologizing when we really did nothing wrong? You hear about somebody having a really bad experience and you feel responsible for it. Now, sometimes you're just gonna say, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. You're not taking responsibility for it. You're just offering, offering care. But where does it move into you having to claim responsibility for it? And you feel like you have to fix it. That's again, harmless versus kindness. And, you know, think about your own life and where you fit in those columns. Maybe it's a little bit of both, but maybe you really need to take a look at this and what kind of spiritual work you need to do to start letting go of some of these. Now, I also would put in here what, what I think we miss a lot, in, especially when we look at this from a psychological standpoint, is how religion played a part in what we understand about kindness, about love. I, in my Instagram uh, sacred space that I did today, I talked about our confusion about love, but I think it also comes carries over to kindness. It can also happen with our educational experience, but we won't have time to talk about that today either. But I think we all know we have some kind of experience about our, our lives in, in school where we realize we were told something about kindness that maybe wasn't really true. Now back to religion, I think it, it goes even to the heart of some of the verses. So I'm gonna read from Ephesians, Ephesians 4 here, which was written by Paul. And I think that I think this might give us a, a clue. So he says in Ephesians, Ephesians 4, uh, chapter 4, verses 31, 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be uh, put away from you along with malice, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now, Jesus speaking, Matthew 7, uh, verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In Luke 10, Jesus says, you shall love the Lord with all your, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. One more from Paul. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant. Now, down in Galatians 5, Paul also says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Now, the reason why I brought those up is because I feel like there's a dichotomy. Now, you can ask 10 different ministers and they're going to give you 10 different answers to this. But my perspective is whenever we hear Paul talking about kindness, he is definitely talking about the, the rising Christian communities. He's planting churches through, throughout the region and he's, he's pleading with them to be kind to one another have your highest beacon be love and compassion for one another so that you can work out some of these differences. Remember, this is a new concept altogether. It's radical. It's dangerous for so many people because at the time the Roman Empire was extremely suspicious of any Christian movements. So he was trying to encourage them and his definition of kindness was about for God's sake, get along. For God's sake, for what's happening, what we're doing here for the future of this movement, get along. Whereas Jesus is talking about our love for God and our love for others is 
deeply entrenched in how we love ourselves. And love and a fruit of love is kindness. Now for me, there's a difference there because Jesus is always talking about first us as in Matthew seven, where he says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So in other words, it starts with how we view ourselves, how we love ourselves, the kindness that we give ourselves. Paul's writings are about focusing on the community. Now in religion, that was a lot of the focus. We didn't do, at least in my experience, there wasn't a lot about that spiritual growth, only how it pertains to how I show up in religion, only how it pertains, how I'm going to commit my time and my money and my resources to perpetuate an institution. So now that's not all churches. I get so tired of saying that, but it isn't all churches. And I've had some religious experiences where it is about nurturing your soul because that's where it starts. But a lot of times it's about if we can obligate you, the obligation of your commitment to your spiritual community is far greater than your nurturing of yourself. So kindness becomes this outward thing where it feels so heavy and these verses are just thrown at us all the time. Be kind to one another, be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, because that they, they focus on that community. When Jesus was encouraging us to focus on ourselves first. Now, circling back, but I think we're getting somewhere as, as our time together closes here. I want to go back to that place where we are talking about a stranger cutting in front of you. Where is your self-worth in those moments? Where is your self-respect, your love? Why is it not okay when someone changes plans on you and not, not tell you? Okay, so let's take it even back farther to where I was talking about those comments. First of all, when, when it, that used to not be the, the case for me all the time. When someone would make a comment, that was toxic. I know I am not in a good place if I'm going to be uber defensive or I'm going to start over explaining or I'm just going to retreat. Now that's different than blocking because I often block people. If I look at their profile and I can tell that they're really entrenched in fear-based theology, I'm not going to allow them to continue to come on to our platforms and abuse our followers. I'm not going to do that because I'm here to help those people who are recovering from religious trauma, who have been dehumanized by this kind of theology. So I'll just block them. And so that's different, but retreating is me giving up. And have I done that in the past? Absolutely. And those are always my cues like, okay, I'm exhausted. I'm not coming from a place I need to work through my own fear or I need to, I just hit another level of something that I need to deconstruct from a belief that about me, that's not true. That doesn't serve where I am right now. So what I can do most often now, because I always want to keep things fluid. This is not about getting someplace and then you just, you get to stay there. It's like working out. No, you have to keep working out. You have to keep, you have to keep utilizing your mind. It's the same thing with spiritual growth, beloved. You're never going to get to a place where it's like, whew, that's done. We just get stronger the more we do it. We get more confident. We get more secure in who we are. We feel that soul connection with God the more we do this work. And if we can do it together, blessed be. But what what I know, when I know I'm in a place of kindness with myself is when I can see one of those hate filled comments and I see it as the opportunity that it is, that it's a teaching moment. I'm not owning it. It's not my truth. I see their hate. I see their fear. I understand it because I used to be them. And I want to grab that comment and I want to act quickly because I want to be able to take it and teach someone before someone else sees that comment and goes, Oh no, that's me. I, yeah, sh that comment is about me and I, I don't belong here. And they're in this spiritual w wilderness and they can't find a spiritual path 
in the in the organized Christian in Christianity that they left and now they're out here and they think that it's found them again and it's judging them. No, I got to grab that comment quickly and I've got to respond and make it the teaching moment that it is. So from that place of courage and kindness, then I can respond. But I know that I'm not there if I feel the fear, if I believe some of what's written. So I, it really is a teaching moment and it's also a reflection of me to say, yes, I am in that place. I'm in that place where I'm, get, I'm grounded in my truth. I'm grounded in that, what Jesus talked about where he said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you because I'm not going to accept their hatred but I can give it back to them in the form of love and growth for those who have been hurt by those exact same words their entire life. Because that's the space of healing. That's the space where we want to, to be. That's the space where we want to live. It's part of our spiritual journey. It's never just healed. It's about healing. It's a journey, dear ones. So I hope this time today has helped you understand a little bit more about what it means to be kind, not a passive kindness, but an active kindness for yourself first and then how you show up in the world. That is the message of Jesus. And that's how once you root yourself in this kind of practice that sheds off the things that no longer serves your highest good, then you will be walking in a place where you can have courage and be kind and blessed be. Okay, beloveds, I'm honored to be in this space with you. I hope you receive something I know I did because the teacher teaches what she needs to hear. And now, beloveds, go in peace and may you be peace. Go in love and may you be loved. Go and know that others are on this journey with you and you are not alone. You are seen and deeply and unconditionally loved, just as you are. Have a good week and I'll see you soon. Bye for now. Thanks for tuning in to another Unca episode of Spirituality Matters. To submit questions to Rev Carla, email us at spiritualitymatters at revcarla.com. Follow at Rev Carla on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Pinterest for more spirituality teachings. Check out her blog posts at RevCarla.com and sign up for email alerts while you're there so you don't miss a thing. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. Bye for now!